Welcome back to Getting Open with me, your host, Andrea Miller. I am super excited for the show I have for you today, featuring one of the all-time great podcast guests. Her name is Dr. Romani. She is everywhere, and she specializes in narcissism. She is the go-to for narcissism. And this is an extra special session because I actually interviewed her for your Tango's Relationship Fitness Summit. And this was one of the most popular sessions. So I wanted to share it with you. Dr. Romani has so many insights on narcissism from how you can heal from it to how you can think about the impact of narcissism in your life. What do you do if you're with a narcissist? And so much more. This is filled with so many actionable takeaways. So let me introduce Dr. Romani. Welcome to another amazing session of the Relationship Fitness Summit. I'm your host of this session. My name is Andrea Miller. I am joined by an amazing guest. But before I introduce her, I just want to remind you real quick, go to the Relationship Fitness Summit Facebook page if you haven't already, because this is a conversation I know you're going to want to interact with others on because what we're going to talk about, almost everybody, I think probably everybody's experience has strong feelings about, and I promise you, it will be a better shared experience. My guest today is Dr. Romani, who is a licensed clinical psychologist in Los Angeles, California, Professor Emerita of Psychology at California State University, Los Angeles, and the founder and CEO of Luna Education Training and Consulting. She is an author of several amazing books, with her most being It's Not You, Identifying and Healing from Narcissistic People. She has a huge social following and is the host of a podcast called Navigating Narcissism with Dr. Romani. She and her riveting and passion work have been featured all over the media. People, I am not joking. She has been everywhere from South by Southwest and TEDx to Red Table Talk, The Today Show, innumerable podcasts, and now she is doing the summit with us. Thank you so much. I'm so so glad to welcome you here to our session. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And so we're going to be talking about, you know, one of your great areas of expertise, you know, when people are narcissistic, when they're not, we're going to try to get into a dash of accountability and blame and hopefully even uh, dabbling into really becoming um, that much more of our amazing authentic selves. So, okay. Um, I just want to start with you told such a beautiful story at the beginning of your book about being a little girl at a circus with braids wanting a in a in a sort of unique situation um a purple satin dress and you deny that and it just it I, no joke it moved me to tears um as someone who could relate to that almost like self abnegation i mean it even gives me chills just saying it and thinking about being that little girl that's like i wanted so bad but i don't feel like i'm worthy and so do you mind just sharing that story because it feels so formative to the work that you did. And I have a feeling if it moved me, like it moved me, it'll move other people and just sort of set the stage for your important work. Yeah. You know, thank you. Thank you for even remembering that. Yeah. I was, I was eight and, you know, and I, and it's funny how that I'll just say the process of even including it in the book, it's been a long day of writing and, you know, you were thinking like, how can I infuse more of myself into this book? And then that story for whatever reason, sort of alighted on me. And it's one that even in my own therapy, I'd, I'd worked on and became a big metaphor. But long story short, eight years old. So what is that? Second, third grade. Um, and I, I grew up in New England in a relatively small town at the time. And certainly we were the only um, Indian family in the town in those years. So it was the 1970s. And um, this cer- traveling circus troupe came to town, came to the school, specifically the school. And they were from New York City. So they were going to probably be more enchanted maybe with a, a little girl with brown skin and, and braids and her hair and all of that. And I was a pretty inhibited kid in the sense that there were whatever the issues were at home and it was sort of be, you know, be basically don't really be seen or heard. And and 
it just wasn't a, um, and it was also a time when some kids, you know, their parents wouldn't want them to be my friends. My parents weren't assimilated into the community. Like it was all a lot of, you know, sort of denial. It was basically keep your head down because if you get noticed, there could be trouble, right? And yet there was a part of my, you know, in children, there is this authentic self. Our, we want our voice to be heard. But in that sort of circumstance, it felt risky as though if I did this, if I went along with it and did anything to get noticed in school, I would get shamed, humiliated, all that kind of stuff. So they, the circus people come and they're giving out roles to everyone. You can be the elephant. You could be the juggler. You know, I remember the boy who got to be the um, ringmaster. He got to wear like a red a red jacket and a black the top, top hat, hat, right? Yep. And then they, the last piece, the piece de resistance, was this purple satin dress. I was, see, it had sequins over it. It was like that deep kind of purple, fringy stuff on it. And the, the part was, you know, some of the people from the troupe pulled it up and like, who would like this? And every girl's hand shut up. Like it was, ooh, ooh, me, me. And they, they picked me. And I, I will get to even saying this, but I literally put my, I put my head down and I, I, I it's, it's, it's funny how you hold these wounds. You, you, I just put my head down and I did it this and, and I had tears in my eyes, but the, the sadness was no match for the fear. And I ended up choosing a part of the costume that would keep me covered up, still make me part of the show, but definitely not someone that would have a spot. Draw attention to herself. Draw attention right? to myself and the attendant harm. So the mess, clearly the message I got was if you're seen, then you're in danger. And so, but for the rest of my life, I wondered, and there were repeated experiences like that, other opportunities that would come my way and I would turn away from because of that fear of being of being seen. And when we think about it, there was, there was sort of, in a way, I can be compassionate for the little girl who said no, because the voice that was saying no was trying to protect her, because it was as though if she said yes, harm could come. So whatever that is in us, and that little girl is still in me, I think the older we get, the more sort of we, we care less what other people think, but we, you know, we start saying the yeses, but I'll say even now, portion 60, I'm definitely at this, this stage of life where I do say my no's because I don't, I don't know, I don't want that searing a light on me, even though I'm an incredibly public person. So, and I think that story captures the experience, not only of people who might grow up in family systems characterized by narcissism, but even in close relationships where it's how dare you be seen do not be seen how dare you eclipse anyone here and if a child or even an adult in a narcissistic relationship puts on the proverbial purple dress they're often shamed they're told that they're show-offs you need all the attention why is everything about you and none of that's true you know it's a moment that's offered and a person wants to embrace and they get shut down but the a person who's more narcissistic would have no problem grabbing at that purple dress and believing that they are owed it or they're entitled to it. And so to me, the larger arc of my work is that so many people have been silenced by these relationships. And I actually, it saddens me to think about how much human potential that we've lost. Well, you're, you are a force of change and, you. and, uh, you know, courage for people to do it. But I just, I do want to add a little bit. First of all, proverbial purple dress. I want to say like, like, let's make a meme, like wear the purple dress, except the purple dress. Like it's a beautiful yeah, metaphor. It's, yeah, and next time I see you, we're going to wear purple, purple dresses purple... to meet each other. <laughs> Something that's incredibly <laughs> moving to me is since the book came out all over the world, I've gone to events and there's people sitting in the front <gasps> row in purple dresses oh. and they've made me dolls wearing purple dresses mm. and it's just they have no Great idea and these have become touchstones and talismans and really a tribute to the little girl with the braids who who was trying to protect herself and a reminder to me and to everyone you know and which is even more meaningful to me because as many people don't know this but purple is also the color of domestic violence awareness so it's you know which is a huge huge um uh, focus of what matters to me. And we know that narcissism and domestic violence are very closely associated. So there's this big, you know, this sort of this big head of steam and meaning around it. So, but it's not, it's so moving. People have given me purple bookcase. It's, beautiful. Flowers. it's been absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Well, purple is a royal color and yes, yeah, it is a royal like, color, you yes. know, top of the chakra. So there's a lot, yeah, there's a right. lot in that. That's little right. did you mm -hmm. little uh, eight year old know. Well, the thing I just wanted to add in part, why it was so moving to me, uh, having been raised by a wonderful family that loved me, but also a family of alcoholics and, you know, lots of other workaholism and, and dysfunction, that feeling of um, my 
until very, very recently, really doubting my worth, um, really feeling like I wasn't important, really feeling like um, I'm not enough. It, you know, that, and I know a lot of people watching and listening to this will go, oh my God, me too. And so I just, I, I am so grateful for your um, sharing that. And I, I add on to that just because we know it's so common. And I feel like as we share and others go, okay, me too. And then we go, okay, and here's how we cross the river so that, that that little girl that tried to protect us, and you know, I love Terry Real will say that adaptive child, um, how how that little girl can then grow into her wise adult yep. and yep. wear the purple dress. <laughs> and wear and oh and wear the purple dress. But but I would also caution from recognize that there will still be some anxiety. It's as though that the little girl's holding your hand and looking up and saying, Are you sure this is gonna be okay? And we have to you know, that that left brain adult self that has to kind of come into it and say, it's going to be okay. But like we carry that anxiety. So even at this age, when I, in any purple dress moment of mine, I am still not fully in my body. There's definitely some fear. There's still working on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is helpful too in, in the spirit of, and I loved so much. I mean, I loved so much your book. I'll add this and then we'll get into questions. Your book was so filled with a balance of um, pragmatism and hope. I feel like you, uh, you know, and especially for people who have been in narcissistic relationships, it, this book is for you. Please read it or listen to it. Um, this idea that that some people will choose to stay in that relationship, and you've you've made it okay for that to be a valid choice, and and yet you give so many practical ways to still be joyful, um, to have a beautiful life, to have agency. But I I appreciate what you're saying, like. Even now, there is still that bit of you that will go, ooh, you know, let me pause. And I think to, to know that and expect that is like, I feel like that's like such a great gift we can give ourselves is to say, okay, let me be prepared. So I don't, you know, like I'm not yet again, you know, kind of feeling like I'm getting, you know, whether it's gaslit or undermined or, or whatever. So, okay, with that, we'll, we'll dive into uh, a whole bunch of questions for you. First of all, I you you define this in the book. Um, you talk about the definition between kind of um, narcissistic personality disorder versus kind of the spectrum of narcissism. The percentage of narcissistic personality disorder is very low, and as you say, it's hard. It's like it's complicated in terms of that diagnosis, and yet there is a massive number of or a substantial. I probably shouldn't say massive. Uh, substantial number of people who would be on the spectrum and I and you also talk about the different kinds of narcissism communal narcissist malignant narcissist and so forth do you have an estimate of how many people would fall in that narcissism mm -hmm. spectrum so we did some preliminary data collection a colleague Heather Harris and, and, and myself and it was a, what we call a general population sample. So basically, we stuck the data collection ladle into the world at large, not just college students, not just people in difficult relationships. And the number we were getting back was about 10%. So 10% of people would have a form a narcissistic personality style that's noticeable enough that someone else would notice it and be bothered or troubled by it. Does that make sense? And so I think that one in 10, you know, 10 people, odds are one of them is narcissistic enough to be a problem. You know, are there people under that threshold? There's, I don't know, a bit of selfishness or a bit of, I shouldn't I, have to I say narcissish. No, yeah, narcissish. narcissish. And you know what? I, I think that at ten, at that in that 10% barrel is probably, like I said, an, they have enough that other people are noticing. What do we always say? A person, we know a person's probably an alcoholic when other people are noticing and commenting on their drinking, right? And so it's it's very similar with narcissism in the sense that other people are saying, oh, you know, this is like, this is not somebody who has empathy. They're they, they they need a lot of validation. They don't really care about other people. They're very selfish, that sort of thing. And so that that our our estimate right now is ten percent. Um, we're obviously going to collect much larger data sets to see how how that number holds up. But I think it's a pretty decent estimate. I mean, that's a massive number, right? I mean, so it's one out of a 10. massive. You do and the then math. you go thirty million ten out of a hundred. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I'm thinking of like okay, I know hundreds of people, which means. <laughs> You know, unless like, you do. Yeah. You know, quite you know, a few you know of those numbers are, are problematic on the on that spectrum. Um, in fact, I had heard from a I was chatting with a um, with a, a, a family lawyer 
who said, and she'd been practicing for like 40 years. So she's been doing this since the 80s. And what she said was that the rise of narcissism is being cited increasingly in the dis dissolution of marriages. And that, you know, maybe over the last five, 10 years, I, I can't recall exactly what that time frame was, but way more than when she started practicing 30 and 40 years ago. Do you think that's accurate? Uh, here's what I would say to that, that point, okay? I don't think it's the rise of narcissism. I actually think these numbers have probably held steady for a while, right? So I, I think our, our, there's a temptation to say there's been this big uptick. I think that what some of this, the technological structures have probably, it's almost like um, if you put tomatoes in a hothouse, you get more tomatoes kind of thing, but the tomatoes are going to grow, right? And so even without the hothouse. So my point is, is that Social media probably gave a lot more juice to some narcissistic folks who once didn't have that megaphone and that platform, but they were still narcissistic, right? And so I don't think that the rise in narcissism has contributed to the dissolution of marriage. I think people who are going through the dissolution of marriage are more often now citing the patterns that are consistent with narcissism as being the issue. Does that make sense? So it's a willingness to say, this stuff isn't okay. And I think for many generations, the bad behavior, the narcissistic behavior that was happening in a relationship was often just sort of put in the drawer of marriage is hard or relationships are difficult or, you know, does that make sense? So I think that it was almost normalized and allowed to be, but I think that this whole rise in narcissism thing, eh, if anything, in fact, um, Dr. Keith Campbell, who's an, a narcissism researcher in, um, at the University of Georgia, in our conversations together, one thing him and I really do agree on, we actually don't think that there's been an increase in malignant or grandiose narcissism. But where the increase has happened is it vulnerable narcissism. And vulnerable narcissism is a form of narcissism that has all the bells and whistles of narcissism, the low empathy, the selfishness, the entitlement, the grandiosity. But it's coupled with a petulance, a sullenness, a victimhood, a passive aggression, a failure to launch, a, a sort of sense of why does everyone else get stuff and I don't. It's, it's this kind of um, aggrieved, sort of angry, uh, um, socially awkward narcissism. So people don't spy it. They're not the shiny, grandiose narcissism who bounds in looking great and holding court. These are people who are actually not always socially successful, but they think they deserve to be. They think they deserve more success. They don't understand why somebody else had it so easy. And I have to say that in a marriage is wretched. It's absolutely wretched. I know and some so, of those people. And now yeah. I'm like, oh, my God, it's yeah, there's a name. And like you're a little it. empathetic. And you're you know, exactly. Because, and then exactly. but then you're like, but come on, like you're you like, come yeah. on. So, oh, so it's, the, it's your little. And that's why it's so problematic, because you feel pity. Like these are people who can't seem to think their way out of a paper bag, but they're so grumpy and it's the silent treatment. And it's like, well, I don't want to go to the party, so you shouldn't go to the party. So people in these relationships see their worlds getting smaller and smaller and smaller all the time. And you're with this person who is never satisfied, never happy. And I, I have to say that that, if anything, it's the the population level awareness. I think, you know, um, Joshua Miller's research on vulnerable narcissism Elsa Ronick's Dam's research on vulnerable narcissism, that stuff was really be beginning to pop in like the early 2000s, like 2007, 2005, like when I was reading some of those papers, what's it been now? 17 years. It makes sense that that people like me who have tried to say, okay, let's translate this to the public. As that's percolated into the public consciousness, people now have a name for this. And the thing that I'm saying is, folks, this isn't going to change. So if you're thinking there's some form of something that can be done, there isn't. So people are then probably telling their therapist, my partner is really narcissistic and I don't want to do this anymore. So I think the therapists are hearing it because the languaging is shifting. Right. And that's, I think, where I feel like we could talk for days about whether TikTok is good or bad for mental health. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm going with bad, but bad. Sure. Okay, I mean, well, I yeah, we got to decide that. Decisive vote against it. Uh, it. But to your point, like there is just so much more talk about it that there is a language. And even like I feel like the term gaslighting has become way more popularized and, you know, manipulation. I mean, manipulation is more common than gaslighting. But I feel like some of these terms have become way more kind of zeitgeisty in a way that I feel like can help. And I love how you in your book, you talk about 
survivors versus victims, which I think is a you know really wonderful kind of phrasing. But it is interesting to give that language to people to go, oh, my God, that's what it is, right? Because if you don't know, you're like, holy crap, I know something is wrong. And I feel like you even touched on that a little bit in your book, too, in your own experience. Like, I, I don't know, to believe, is the sky, somebody's telling me the sky is not blue, but I can see it's blue. Yep. Yep. And so Gaslight was the Merriam-Webster Dictionary made Zeitgeist the word of the year in 2023. So when you say zeitgeist, it's there. It's right there. That's so, And that was a kind of word um, until probably late 90s, early 2000s. Gaslighting was a word that was either only used by philosophers and psychologists and the occasional political strategists. And that was about it. And it was definitely not even part of the public conversation. Ironic, because it, it only, the word only even came into existence through a film and a play, a play in a film. Like it wasn't even a term. The play in the film made it a word. So... I think that, that it even came out of this artistic space, but then it kind of went away. I think some psychoanalytic folks wrote about it, but it kind of became quiet. It laid quiet for a while. And then it sort of, again, the only, the first people I ever heard the term from were, um, were, uh, ther were psychologists. And so they're absolutely becoming more zeitgeisty. We are having more of a public conversation about this when... The nature of celebrity change, the nature of politics change, the nature nature of corporate America change. The society shifted, not only to accommodate narcissism, but to incentivize it. Narcissism's been around since there have been people around. This is not new. This is all of human history. So it's a um, it's something we name now, but the name's pretty new. I think we've only been talking about it with this word narcissism, uh, auto rank and folks like that, early part of the 20th century. Yeah, I mean, it, it just, it strikes me, like you say, it's been around forever, but it, you know, it feels like in terms of public consciousness, what we, um, almost what we are becoming inured to in terms of bad behavior, it, you know, is, is a lot of it. And, uh, you know, I kind of link it to uh, hyper toxic individuality. And it's like, and that, that's all, like, it's almost becoming normalized and okay. No bueno. I mean, it just, it, it does feel like it, it, you know, before it'd be like, no way would that be okay. But it, it does feel like now societally, there is a greater acceptance and a greater tolerance, at least for some, especially powerful men, but so, you know, some powerful women too, or famous women. And I know? think the change, the, but the shift also has been, like I said, it's always been there and it's always been harmful. It was only in the 1970s that we were even willing to call domestic violence, domestic violence, right? So I think that what we've got to remember is that the thing that's changed is that even though the culture might be accommodating it, even in rewarding it, it's been there. We didn't have a name for it. And we actually kind of accepted it as part of how relationships worked. And, oh, yeah, well, people are going to physically abuse a spouse. That's just the nature of marriage. I guess. Honestly, it reminds me a lot of alcoholism too. Like it would just be normal to go out and get loaded, and, and you know, and maybe you know, do something abusive, and and eventually, then it, it's still very prevalent, obviously. But it it feels like there's much less of a stigma, and now there are you know, it's treatments like you un understand a lot of the terms, and you understand you know how the roles that people play, and so forth. Okay, back to narcissism. So, what are the signs you're in a narcissistic? relationship and do you feel like people too many people are saying oh my god he's a narcissist or she's a narcissist yeah so I'll, I'll start with the sign so a narcissistic person is a person who has relatively low empathy and definitely inconsistent empathy they're grandiose they're arrogant they need lots of validation uh, lots of attention and they often go and seek it out they're deeply entitled they're very selfish very superficial, appearance-focused, all of that stuff, very vain, they envy other people. There's a lot of hostility. They're very controlling. They need to dominate. They need to be the ones in power. Those are the sort of the broad, sort of broad strokes of narcissism. The way it shows up in a relationship is a person who's chronically manipulative. They, they do these patterns, like I said, like gaslighting. They take advantage of other people's vulnerabilities. Um, they might, they'll learn things. They'll, they'll pretend to care about someone, get information from them, and then use that against them down the road. Um, narcissistic people are very status-seeking, so relationships serve a role of giving them social status. How they choose a partner, all of that is very much about status and supply. 
Narcissistic people are also very impulsive and disinhibited. They'll often say what they want, do what they want, make messes, and then give sort of hollow apologies afterwards. Their emotions tend to be dysregulated. They'll often get angry very quickly. And once they blow up at someone, 10 minutes later will act like nothing happened, which leaves the other person feeling like they're losing their mind. They're, again, they're very controlling. Um, they're also, they don't take responsibility for their behavior. They're not accountable for what they do. There's a lack of self-awareness. There's a lot of lying and betraying and um, blaming other people, even if they've clearly done something wrong. Then they'll do things like, if somebody says, you did this thing wrong, now it's your fault I did this thing wrong, right? So even if they do say, okay, I did it wrong, but you're the reason I did yeah. it wrong. The blame, and the blame is bad, right? Yeah, it's a big yeah. part of it. They can't take that in. And there, there's also an incapacity to manage things like frustration or um, stress or disappointment. And they often feel victimized, like people are out to get them. At the core of narcissism, it's a deep, deep insecurity, right? This sense of of shame. And, and so it's a tricky thing to know that, right? Because it drives this pity and this empathy, like, oh, they're insecure. However, what then? You're permanently a punching bag of an insecure person. And when people are in these relationships, the fallout is things like rumination, confusion, a sense of helplessness, hopelessness, powerlessness, a chronic sense of worry, self-doubt, self-blame. What am I doing wrong? I'm not enough. People in these relationships feel very isolated because it's not unusual for narcissistic people to present beautifully in public. Oh, gosh, you're so lucky. Like, what a great guy. And you're like, and people are thinking, oh, my gosh, there nobody gets it. So I must be the one who looks out of my mind. And then people thought, find their world shrinking more and more because this terrible thing they're going through, it's almost like people won't believe them, right? Um, people also will report things like they're distracted. They can't concentrate. They're... Um, not sleeping well. They, um, it, it's not a good scene if you're in a narcissistic relationship. Yeah. Okay. And so how often do you feel like people are, are mis, um, labeling or mischaracterizing yeah. their partner? Mm -hmm. This happened. Okay. So, you know, there's, there's, there's blessings and curses of social media and the, and all the many ways we have to get information out there. Right. The blessing is, is that people are hearing, reading, learning about narcissism in a way they never did. I've worked with many clients who've been married 30, 40 years. And they said, listen, if I, if there had been a you, if there had been this kind of content, these kinds of books 10, 30 years ago, I never would have stayed this long. There was no name for this. And once they had the name, they were making decisions from a different place. So to me, that's the important reason this stuff has to be out there. However, it gets tricky when people, I don't know, they're partner doesn't empty the dishwasher, they're narcissistic. Their partner doesn't remember their birthday, they're narcissistic. And that's really what they're, they're, they're hanging their hat on. Even some people will say, my partner um, is flirting with the waitress, my partner's narcissistic. Maybe they are. All of those instances, they may be. Narcissistic people would definitely do those things. But in and of themselves, somebody um, showing up 10 minutes late doesn't make them narcissistic. Somebody um, not liking one of your friends doesn't make them narcissistic. It could be. But that by itself is not it. And by using this term as a throwaway term, it does harm in that it fosters a misunderstanding. But I also think that what it does is people who are actually going through these relationships, they feel shamed. They feel as though, well, people are now saying this isn't really a thing. Or And there is a, there's a whole sort of the narcissism, the, the, that, that sort of whole landscape online of like, the pro-narcissism people, right? Or anyone who talks about narcissism is a terrible person. And so a lot of people who are in these relationships who are already feeling so confused and so fragile, given all that's happened to them, they will say, well, maybe I'm not using this word right. They're the first ones to doubt themselves. So the people who actually are in narcissistic relationships are the people who question it. And the people who probably maybe even could be narcissistic are the ones who will accuse other people of being narcissistic just on a dime. Yeah. It, well, I mean, listen, if 10% if of the population is narcissistic, that's enough to have a critical mass of anti-narcissistic, you know, like, okay, well, we can see where that's that's coming from. We want to sort of stay closeted over here. Yeah. And I just, I do think it's just uh, something that you, you touched on that I really want to call, I mean, this is a relationship fitness summit and it just feels like, you know, we were talking just for even a minute or two before we started, you know, what's going, you know, po politically and so forth. Oh my God, everybody is so stressed out. The um, Surgeon General recently 
um, uh, issued an advisory just about the severe pressure parents are under, right? And so when I think about your examples of he didn't um, empty the dishwasher again, she's, um, you know, she, um, you know, disrespected me, you know, so everybody's kind of pointing the finger at, at each other and saying, oh, they must be a narcissist. To me, it's like, oh, can we just give each other, you know, in those instances, when it's not that laundry list, can we give each other grace, right? And not use the the labels, right? Because it just feels like because that, you know, that now there's this impulse to say, oh, well, I'm just going to label this person out of frustration, which doesn't help anybody. No, I think that the big problem is that here, here the rub is this. We you people use this word narcissism and they don't know what it means, right? If I were to tell you, hey, for dinner, I'm going to have chicken and celery and chicken and um, uh, carrots and and water and salt and spices, you'd be like, oh, you're having chicken soup for dinner, right? So it gets to be a little bit unwieldy to keep giving the laundry list of everything that's in it. So narcissism becomes the word soup or the word cake or the thing that represents all the ingredients. But I think then it means that people have to be aware of the ingredients because what the label does is it distances people from the actual experience they're having. And it also distances them from what is actually acceptable in a relationship. None of us are perfect every day in a relationship. But when we're not perfect and we're healthy or moderately healthy, we make amends. We try to be better. We are accountable, right? So two people could be disrespectful, but one of them could say, I am so sorry I said that I had no right to. I hurt you. I am so sorry. And this is, I am, and I'm going to be better. And you see the change. They don't do that again, right? And they don't even try to come up with excuses. But a narcissistic person will say, who do you think you are telling me I can't do that? Like, maybe you're the problem. And then it's blame shifting and gaslighting. So it's not as much the disrespect, but often what comes in the wake of that is this person, again, making amends, trying to make it right, showing accountability, showing self-awareness. When that's not happening, don't need a label. You just need a lot more words, okay? But we have to be willing to also recognize what's not okay. One time something, again, I learned in graduate school, really important trick. Something, sometime, at the times when something happens once, it happens. When something happens twice, it's a coincidence. When it happens three times, it's a pattern. And when you've got a pattern, you've got a problem, especially if it's unhealthy behavior. Yeah, well, I love that almost like as a little bit of a litmus test, um, using that accountability um, sort of uh, test or, you know, kind of a accountability uh, uh, hook is like, okay, is this person actually willing to say, oh, my bad or not, right? Or to your point, even turning around and saying, not only is it not my bad, but it's actually your bad, even though I'm the, you know, uh, instigator here. Um, can you heal from narcissism in your experience? So meaning, the, can the can the, can they no well actually those I didn't think about like that I meant can the survivor but I'd be mm -hmm. curious about both okay so we'll start with the survivor so a person who's been through a narcissistic relationship can they heal from it yes but the way how about, if they, were, how about if they were kids with you know raised they by narcissists heal. Oh, absolutely okay. absolutely here I see it all happen all the time here's the but though okay it has to do with the severity the of the um, the narcissism, the protections for the child. So in other words, sometimes it all only takes one protective grandparent or a protective aunt or someone who shows a genuine interest in the child. It's not to say that that narcissistic parent, for example, won't be harmful, but one place where that child is actually seen and valued, then that becomes a really, um, that becomes an incredibly important space as a buffer against it. But the severity the nature of the exposure, the, 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 the health of the other. Okay, if you have two narcissistic par parents, forget it. All bets are off. You will likely suffer for a long time unless you fully go no contact from that system. But when there's one narcissistic parent and one healthier parent, it gets a little trickier because a healthier parent can be a buffer. They can be very protective. But that brings up a lot of fraught issues too because people will often say, because the, the, not, the, the not narcissistic parent, as it were, might be quite trauma bonded with the narcissistic parent and may have actually been running in circles to please the narcissistic parent, which meant that the children in that home often felt abandoned by everyone. So, and they will feel a lot of guilt at feeling abandoned by the parent who is not narcissistic because they will slowly recognize they were also up under something. But in fact, there really was no one there attending to the kids. All energy was going to that narcissistic parent. 
I see people heal from this all the time, but I do have to say it does become a psychological monkey on your back, right? It is definitely something that in adulthood, you see a lot of self-doubt, you see a lot of uh, self-blame, um, a greater likelihood of feeling like you have to do and please in relationships. Um, there can be more anxiety in adulthood, um, a, a, a strong achievement and perfection orientation to the to a fault where a person sort of exhausts and burns themselves out, um, a, a chronic fear of failure. So those sorts of things will dog someone. And there's also a risk of repeating the cycle and, and choosing a partner who's narcissistic. And not even saying choosing, getting stuck in a relationship with a partner who's narcissistic. So can you heal? Yes, right? Healing means a lot of different things. And I've seen people you know, who've had narcissistic parents who go on to thrive, but they'll say there's always that thing. And there's also always a lot of grief when you've had a narcissistic parent, because that's the one thing you don't get a do-over on is a childhood. So you had a childhood that was relatively psychologically unsafe. You don't get to fully develop your identity at exactly the age you should develop your identity, which is childhood, right? It's very hard to start doing that building up of the authentic self when you're in your 20s. Now to your other question, can you heal from narcissism? The narcissist, you know, the, the research on change in narcissism, there was just a very good article in the New York Times that it was based on a, on a meta-analysis, an article that summarizes lots of articles um, that just came out this year. And it showed, not really, that narcissism is a very stable trait, okay? And so just like all personalities, agreeable people don't go become, become disagreeable. Narcissistic people don't become nice. And so it's a very stable trait over time and some little blips in here and there in, in older age, but not much to write home about. And so what it means is that by and large, narcissistic people are always going to be selfish and entitled. Like that's, that's what this is. Are there time? I, my read on the literature, and there's not good literature on this, is if a narcissistic person's narcissism largely originates from traumas like a, an abusive parent, an alcoholic parent, something like that, like you can trace it, a neglect, um, attachment fails, any of that. The therapist has a place like has a has a place to begin like trauma informed therapy, because some of the narcissistic patterns, we can see them as sort of being a response to trauma. If that's the case, good trauma informed therapy that the client is committed to and they can break through those defenses and the person can feel safe, maybe we'll see a little bit of a shift. But in the baseline narcissistic person, probably not. In, let me put it this way. We may see change. It's typically not enough to make a difference to the people around them. Got it. Okay. Uh, that's sobering. Uh, just to go on that rabbit hole, just, just a pinch. I don't want to go too far because there's so much more I want to get to. But I, I am mostly curious when I think about generational trauma and abuse and alcoholism and all these things that ended up being transmitted, you know, often over many generations. I mean, I don't want to be an apologist for narcissists, but is it is it like a lot of other forms of abuse where the that narcissism becomes almost like hereditary or passed down generationally? I've never, I, I can think of in all my years of clinical practice and everyone else's clinical practice and everything I've read, I got to tell you, I've seen maybe one, maybe two cases we're in a multi-sibling family, we're in a multi-sibling family, all the siblings were narcissistic. Because by your telling, then that should be held in the majority of siblings. And what we see, it's typically not the majority. Like I, I'm thinking of multiple clients and people I've talked with and all that who came from four, four children homes, three children homes, one of the children would be narcissistic and the but other what about, and the, but what about from parent to child? How typical That's what I'm saying is parent to oh, child. They, oh, they had a narcissistic parent. Okay. They had a narcissistic parent that those parents had three, four kids. One of them maybe would be narcissistic. So the other ones are not. The other ones were anxious and self-doubting and all that other stuff. So intergenerationally, certainly a narcissistic parent can beget a narcissistic child, but so can a neglectful parent. So can an abusive parent, all of that. But not everyone. I mean, I, I again, I, I don't, I can't tell you how many people. And what we know is that trauma resilience, that sort of is innate, it's not, it's not the most common thing. If a person puts a child through enough, the odds of a good outcome in childhood really drop a lot, right? The more adverse childhood experiences, the greater the likelihood of a poor outcome. But I think that it's, the challenge becomes this. There's obviously there's truth to what you're saying. These cycles are intergenerational, but not fully. 
And many times narcissistic people bandy that about as an excuse. I've been through stuff. I've been through a lot. So what? We're supposed to give you a free pass forever? So to which a person can then say, you've been through a lot. I wish you all good things. I hope you figure it out. I ain't staying around for act two. So it's like you go then go go in peace, figure it out. But I'm not but the narcissistic person saying, I've been through a lot. You shouldn't correct my behavior. I should get to be the way I want. I've been through a lot. That and and that's how they jump onto that intergenerational bandwagon. Yeah. Like they yeah. turn it into something that Yeah, that no, totally. Was. I mean, I I ultimately think no matter who you are, I mean, as a grown up, ultimately you have to be accountable. Like you either have agency and and flex it and exercise it in a healthy way. Or, or you don't, and you blame others, and you're, and you lack accountability, and, and you suffer, right? I mean, it's just, it's kind of back to that core personal responsibility. And there, obviously, it's not easy to change. Let's face it, it's not easy to change, but it certainly is, is possible if you're serious, you know. And to your point, so it's a good segue. How do people, whether, you know, especially um, survivors of narcissism, how do they step out of the invalidating shadow and reclaim themselves? You know, I would say that th there's a couple of things. Obviously, if a person can access good, high quality therapy with a therapist who understands narcissism or at a minimum understands trauma, that's a really useful tool. Number two are healthy social supports. Having even one or two validating voices, a friend, family member, anyone, but people who are solid and see you, that's actually one of the greatest antidotes we have. You would think that seems so simple. Many people don't have access to that kind of person, and those relationships haven't always blossomed in their lives. That can also be a really important tool. Meaningful and purposeful pursuits, things that are yours, and it could be it could be work, it could be hobbies, it could be other interests, it could be human relationships, raising yeah, children. Yeah, feeding yourself, actually. right? You're feeding yeah. yourself. You're feeding, not only feeding yourself, but you're a part of something, right? You're, yeah, you're yeah, part yeah, of a, yeah. You're part of a system yes. where... And it's reciprocal. You're doing things and there's a joy you're giving and usually you pay it forward. If we look at the research on trauma, one thing that we also know is that a big part of um, of healing from, from trauma is ultimately getting to a point where you give back, right? And some a lot of people who've gone through these kinds of relationships, be, they go back to school, they become therapists, they become divorce coaches. Um, they, they do some, they volunteer, but they do something to try to give back to the world, whatever form that feels right to them um, based on what they've been through. So we're talking about things like, you know, working through the grief, getting, feeling emotionally stable again, getting through the grief, and then really working, meaning, purpose, human relationships, belonging, and then that, that sense of giving back. It really does have that kind of healing arc. It's not easy. I mean, it's not, I'm saying these things like as though they're so easy to access, and they're really not, but I see it happen all the time. I mean, I see it happen all the time. And so it can happen. But, and this is what I always tell folks is you are not going to come out the other side of this walking around confident, loud, and proud. There is always going to be that little, that sort of like, oh, am I doing this right? There will be those dark nights of the soul. That was an indoctrinated process, especially if you had a narcissistic parent. And the courage is to keep on keeping on despite those dark nights of the soul. And so that's, that's, that to me is that I, I, I always caution survivors. They'll always say they sort of hold the standard of like, well, how come I don't feel fully confident? I'm like, because you're probably never gonna. But the fact that you're getting up and trying new things, these are all going in the wind column. And those moments of catching yourself, we can also reframe those as moments of compassion and moments of empathy and moments of recognition and that we can still care for ourselves. We've been through something. And because the world will never be narcissism free, it's very, very rare. There's some, listen, Andrew, the there's thing, some people out there I've met who have literally said to me, they, they picked up my book idly and said, you know, maybe they've met me at an event that's just a book event or something. And they'll say, I don't think I know any narcissists. And of course, the first thing that goes to my mind is like, maybe it's because of you, but I don't say that. But I think that there are some people out there who sort of, you know, basically won the Powerball. They had really empathic, loving parents. They met and, you know, got in a long-term committed relationship with an empathic person. They live in an empathic community. They have sufficient resources. Life kind of went their way. Um, many people, if you go to that 10% number, you know, 10 people, one of them's narcissistic, 
many, many others, we know that even if we heal from some primary narcissistic relationships, this replays. We might meet someone at work. We may collaborate with someone like that. We might meet another friend. You might date someone. And that becomes a re-experiencing and people feel like they have to re-heal again. Mm -hmm. Well, it's certainly heartening. And when I think about, um, even like you say, maybe, maybe you'll never be always loud and proud. And there's that little, that little part of you that still can feel that dark night of the soul. It just even, I guess, even maybe in my own experience, it's like, it doesn't have to have the power over us that it used to. Right. And it, it feels like it's like, okay, that, that part is still there and it's not going away. Um, but, but the relate, at least for me, I feel like my relationship to that part of myself is different. And, and the other one, I just wanted to come back to, you talked about how people can heal in terms of great therapy books. Like, I mean, you didn't say it, but I'm saying it, um, uh, books like yours, um, having having those relationships that you can be seen you talked about um finding that purpose finding a you know finding that community but you 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 referenced in that that grief is part of it and i just really want to drive that point home because i just i so often feel like oh we want to heal but it, i mean and you're the expert so maybe i should rather than ask it than state it is it is it inevitable that you're going to have to really feel that grief before you can get to the other side is there any avoiding the grief Okay. I figured. That's, keep it simple. No, there's not. Uh, and I think we spend so much of our lives trying to avoid grief, which is unfortunate. Because, you know, to me, emotions are like weather, right? They're going to come through and sometimes they're going to come through fierce. But a hurricane is never going to last for 10 years, right? And while it's happening, it feels like it's the end of days. Grief is that. There is no circumventing it. There is no no one you can there's no numbing it there is no digging underneath it there is going through it right as robert Frost, but the only way out is through you've got to go through it and it is the most human of experiences all feelings are human experiences but the grief and because it's not a um it's not a normalized grief it feels a bit more disenfranchised or it's, it's like an ambiguous grief there's no closure so people are still alive you know it's like I, as I it's something i say to folks it's like dead men can't text you know, so this is not someone's died. These are people who can still keep sending you mean text messages and leave you off a dinner invitation or make fun of you. And so I think that the grief doesn't go away. You're reminded that there's a family out there, but you don't feel safe visiting them. You know, there's a reminder that you met and married someone and you thought it was going to be forever, but then they cheated on you and they move on with their new person right away. And you're sort of sifting through the wreckage. That's a grief that keeps coming in waves. And I tell people, it, and people say this feels like it's going on forever. I know it does, and bad days feel like that, but you got to get through to that other side. And there's no formula for it, but it's the importance of not looking away from it. Thank you for that. I always feel like I actually lost a, a close friend recently and was just, uh, you know, sort of um, conversing with some others uh, who also love this lady and just this idea of how um, unpredictable and nonlinear grief is. And so, just as a public service to myself and everybody listening, you know, it's like you can't avoid. I mean, you you can try, but at your own peril. And and then just know that it's gonna most likely be pretty unpredictable. But you get most. I would don't you agree that the and I don't want to get into too again a rabbit hole on grief. But it strikes me that people who are will really willing to do the work, um, the vast 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 majority can get to the other side of grief. Absolutely, it's 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 a human experience, right? It is going to happen to all of us, and it's a process. And most people will get to the other side. Yeah. Well, I, I just also want to go back to when you said a few minutes ago one of the ways that uh, survivors can heal from narcissism. You referenced, um, you know, really cultivating relationships with people that can truly see you. And I just I want to give a shout out. It feels so counterintuitive, but the idea of depending on how bad it was, it, it can be really scary to be fully seen, right? And so just to say, like, I even experienced that. And I, I mean, I've accomplished a lot and so forth. And yet, so like, it's this weird kind of conundrum where it's like, ooh, you know, like, I, I don't want to be totally seen. And yet, that's, that's where there's, in, you know, like, to be willing to be really seen, that, you know, like, that's where, you know, intimacy and trust and all the good stuff 
uh, resides, and yet it can be really damn scary, right? And we and we know that's what we need, yet it can be really damn scary. Yeah, and I think maybe even more than being seen is to be attuned to. And I think that might even be more important than being seen because to be attuned to is that there is a person noticing, you know, uh, many people in narcissistic relationships will say, I'm, I'm really doing everything. I'm making sure the trains run on time. I'm making sure the kids stay out of the way. I'm making sure the house gets clean, the plumber gets called, ask the narcissistic person to do one, the narcissistic spouse to do one thing, and they lose it, okay? And the attuned to piece could be as simple as someone comes in that house and says, slow down, honey, you've been doing everything today. Like, at least let me do this load of laundry. That's what I mean by, that's even more so than the, you're great at this, but just that simple act of being attuned to is actually a game changer because most people who've been in these relationships have not experienced that. Yeah. Well, that's great. I love that. I hadn't heard that phrase before, but it's, I feel like a little, little, uh, little easier to invite that in. Um, is there an exercise we can do for people who have been hurt by narcissists? And, and I, I feel like probably even other, you know, others, but you know, since we're largely focusing on narcissism, is there something you can walk me through? One thing I, I tell people and, and suggest to them is that if you've been in a narcissistic relationship and, and you've been hurt by it, probably one of the most common fallouts is self-blame. And so one thing we, I'll often suggest that people do is to sit and reflect, what are the things that you felt you had to do to stay close to this person? What did you have to do so to keep them close, to keep the trains running on time, to make the relationship work, right? And the list is usually say nothing, be everything. Don't be good, but not too good. So you don't want to outshine them. Keep your head down. Don't ask questions. Uh -huh. Don't bother. You know, it, it, it was, but what, what the list invariably is self-silencing, right? And I think that just writing all that down and then seeing what it's all culminated into can help a person see what, what, how really in essence that this was an unsafe relationship, right? And how they, anytime we're, it's almost like if we're in a place that's not safe, it's a place that is naturally unsafe. There's rocks falling or there's a risk of drowning or something, or it's a, a an area where there's a, a, you know, you wouldn't want to cross a busy freeway, cro you know, cross it by, by your feet or something like that. So we have all, all our senses are working to keep us safe. Like I better wear a helmet. I better not go there at night. I better this, I better that. It's very similar what we're doing here, right? When we're trying to survive, we're not thriving. And so I think that kind of an exercise to really reflect out what did I need to do to stay close to this person is an eye opener on what we had to do to survive. And we learn that because a lot of people say, gosh, I feel like I didn't, I didn't ever do anything. And like, why did I do more in my life? I'm like, ooh, when I think about all you've done to survive this relationship, you've done a ton. And it really can sort of open up people to this was a lot of work and I didn't even know it. Well, that's what I was just thinking. I'm like, Ooh, what an interesting exercise because I would expect how much of, of that, um, uh, adaptive behavior is, is pretty dang unconscious. Like it's you're, survival. It's survival. Yeah. Like really? you're just, you're doing, yeah. you know, you're kind of going, you know, about it to your point about survival. Like, like it's just you're you're moving on instinct and you're you're doing all these things and by really sitting you know taking that time to sit down pen to paper and say what did I what did I do um, to get close to this person and 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 kind of keep things okay it it does feel like probably a deceptively powerful way to to bring that that um, just probably how how much you've done to to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't think people realize how much they did do. And when you realize that it's, it's sort of because, again, a lot of people will look back at their time in any narcissistic relationship and say, I feel like I kind of went backwards in life. And then they feel like, well, it's maybe because I didn't do anything. Maybe I was lazy. Maybe I was this. And we really unearthed it, how much they were doing. But it was all in the name of safety. The person shouldn't have to be putting that much effort into feeling safe in a relationship. Without a doubt. Um Okay, I think we might have, I have another question, and maybe there's an exercise with, with this or not. Um, when I think about, again, kind of back to our society, it feels like everybody feels a little hyper-reactive 
And I can imagine that for a lot of survivors of narcissism, they've got to be hyper vigilant. And I remember in your book, you were talking about like, oh, if you talked about role play, you know, so you're prepared for a conversation. Sometimes you'll do that with the therapist. You talked about like, like five, four, three, two, one, looking outside. Can you just share some of those other examples of just how um, people can prepare themselves and learn to not overreact? Because it strikes me, it's like, okay, here we go again. Uh, you know, one plus one equals eleven. Because this the the narcissist has gone on the attack again, and now the survivor, rather than saying, okay, I was prepared, I'm I'm gonna really try not to take it personally. You know, they're they're being hyper vigilant. Is are there any other exercises you can recommend? Okay, so one thing I would say is like it's tricky, right? I always um I'm. It, because when a person is coming at someone, screaming at them, accusing them of things, betraying them, it's normal to have a reaction, right? The challenge with hypervigilance or hyperarousal is that the um, a person's tightly wound, right? So, and one of two things happens: either a person reacts very strongly emotionally, or they numb entirely, right? When we think of what the the sympathetic nervous system responses are: fight, flight, uh, freeze, fawn, submit. Um, we, we either withdraw, we or try to win them over or, you know, again, completely freeze or, you know, we, we get into it with them. Right. So we're never going to subvert our sympathetic nervous system, right? It, it's doing a very important thing. It's keeping us safe. Right. But what we can teach it is about the nature of the threats. And, you know, one thing that, that can be very, very helpful is like, again, the, the, the exercises that bring us back into our body, whether that's breathing, whether that's being aware of our surroundings, that can definitely be something that grounds us. But I'd even go back on that. There's something I call, as part of healing, radical acceptance. And radical acceptance, actually, in a strange way, it a person who is finding that they have very strong reactions to what's happening, that gets complicated because some people have strong reactions because they're actually in a trauma state. And so they're, they're, rea they're having that strong reaction. But radical acceptance doesn't mean you're okay with what just happened or what is happening. Radical acceptance is the here we go again, right? Here we go again. Of course, this is who they are. But radical acceptance, they are not going to change. You know they're not going to change. There's nothing you can do about it. It is not okay. It still hurts even if you do radically accept it. That in a way that the... Um, I always say that I know that a survivor has made leaps and bounds in their healing when they're no longer surprised by this person. They may be disgusted by them. They may hate them. They may want nothing to do with them, but they ain't surprised. They may roll their eyes. Or, or even kind of maybe thing. resistant. It's like like to the point of radical acceptance where it's like, may, like, like kind of an uh, maybe it, make peace to a certain extent is that, i wouldn't that say make peace no because make peace feels like a sign off it's definitely this is what this is it ain't gonna change this is not okay and it stinks that's radical acceptance right and as long as i'm in this it's going to be like this so one one of the techniques i talk about in the book is i call it the prepare and release technique so if you know you're going to spend time especially if you're going to have to have a difficult conversation, difficult interaction, go to a family wedding, any of those things. Number one is to prepare. And that preparation can be many things. It can be getting into your body before you get out of the car to see them. It can be making sure you get enough sleep the night before. It can be leaning into your breathing techniques so you can do them. And listen, I'll, this is going to sound farcical, but it's really not. It's because you can't set a boundary with a narcissistic person. So one thing actually that was... that. Uh, client of, of mine and I, we were talking about and she used, and now I've shared it with so many, is this idea, we call it narcissism bingo, is you write down the things they do that are really not okay. Criticize you, make fun of your appearance, lie to you, um, scream at you, give you the silent treatment, compare you to other people, make the list, hey. then turn it into a game. They do five of these. Either some people say, you don't say bingo out loud, but like either if you are in a situation where you might be like, well, once you get five, I'm out of here. Or if it's not a situation you could leave easily, maybe like a wedding or something like that. <laughs> I tell clients, is there something you want? Like, is there like a, a 
night a day away in a spa or a um a skirt you've been wanting to buy or or I don't know something and that's your prize so now they're behaving horrifyingly and you're kind of smiling inside saying I'm getting that skirt in brown I am putting it in my I already have it in my cart I am hitting order so it's a that's what I'm saying is that it's the it's the callback of your agency I mean it's just a little way to kind of reclaim some agency there but it, and it's also to see it clearly, right? So all of that happens. You go through the thing. You set a timer. You know, like at an hour and a half, this is no longer sustainable. So you set things up so you can leave early. You go with two cars to your in-laws, whatever it may be. Then when you're done with having said interaction, argument, difficult negotiation, whatever it is, you don't just pick up and start your day and start doing your thing. You need a moment of release. And that usually means resting your body. That could be sitting someplace and breathing. It doesn't have to be fancy. You don't have to go to like some meditation yoga spot. You can do it in the front seat of your car. Breathing, getting into your body. You might have mantras that are useful for you. Whatever it may be, something that grounds you. Sometimes people take a shower, take a bath, take a walk, be in nature, call a friend, journal, but listen to a a, a podcast you love, listen to a music you love, but get yourself back into you. You're caring for yourself after this not very healthy interaction. And it's a way of saying, I I need a minute. I need to reconstitute. And those two things, preparing and then releasing, can be sort of a way that if you do have to manage these kinds of relationships, you might actually be less reactive because the bingo almost turns it into a chuckle instead of like, how could you say that? I'm like, you don't want to stop them because you're a little gallus too, humor. Yeah, I was going to say, you're two terrible things away from yeah. a massage. Come on, bring so another one. Let, let them keep doing it because you yeah, can get up the facial out of this. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. All right, um, Dr. Romani, we have to come to a close. Unfortunately, I would love to close with two things. One, um, for you to let everybody know where to find you and then for you just to have final word on, you know, really kind of any any message that you'd like to give our audience or however you would like to close our session would be wonderful. Absolutely. So you can find me on all social media at Dr. Romani, spell the word doctor out, D-O-C-T-O-R, Romani. Um, you can check out my website. You can go to my YouTube vid- uh, channel. We put out new videos every single day. Those of you who want to do a deeper dive into healing, I have a very robust healing program for survivors of narcissistic relationships. We have monthly workshops, Q&A sessions, a remarkable and supportive community, guided meditations, all of it. And then we also have the new Dr. Romani Network. And then the Dr. Romani Network is an opportunity to ask me questions directly, learn from our guests. It's a, Imagine a podcast where then you get to ask the podcast guests questions. And so... It's a um, it's a chance to learn from people who are experts who have lived experience, but also hear other people's questions and learn from that. So that's also a new kind of thing we've rolled out and are continuing. Oh, that's to amazing! That must be so healing and validating, right? But because it is so it is. common. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it's mm-hmm. like just hearing about other survivors' yeah. experiences, yeah. their tips and hacks. Okay, that's mm-hmm. wonderful. Yeah. So it's um yeah so it's a. Uh, a lot of things we're doing. I have books. It's Not You is the most recent. Obviously, you can get my book. And I have two other books. One, Should I Stay or Should I Go? Or And Don't You Know Who I Am? So I have three books on narcissism. You can get there and get those anywhere you buy books. And so we have a lot of different things. And if you're a therapist and you want to learn more about how to work with patients who are clients who are going through narcissistic relationships, I have a 36-hour program that can lead to certification in working with clients. You can get information about that at PESI, P-E-S-I dot com, and go to the course by Dr. Romani Vassala on working with clients experiencing narcissistic abuse. All right. That's amazing. That is a, a lot of resources for people. And as far as uh, final word and how you'd love to uh, leave our uh, viewers today. That I think that when so many people go through narcissistic relationships, they come out of them feeling damaged and less than. And that what I'd actually, I'd always tell people, do you know who the most interesting people in the room are? Are people who have survived these relationships. And we can, we survivors can smell each other out. And so recognize, I often view it as sort of a riff on the hero's journey. If you go through this, you're going to be able to go through anything. And so take some chances, try new things. And the more you try different things, even if the loaf of bread doesn't rise, or you fall flat on your face on the paddle board or whatever it is, do these things away from the narcissistic person. Have both triumphs and misses away from the narcissist so you can have this experience 
of success. And if you want to call it failure, I think anytime mm -hmm. you try, it's not a failure mm -hmm. without filling that sort of learning what doesn't work, <laughs> right. that terrifying voice of being made fun of or telling you you're ridiculous for trying or that's not a big deal. Like put yourself out in the world because what these relationships do is they often keep us from living in our full authentic self. So there is a, a whether you, and, and healing can happen whether you stay in the relationship or whether you leave. Leaving is not a requirement to heal. And finally, forgiveness is optional. Forgiveness is not the path to healing. In some cases, people say, this person really, really harmed me. I'm like, then you don't need to forgive them. You will heal just fine either way. That's a very personal journey, and no one can mandate that for you. Oh, I love that. So much wisdom. Thank you so much, Dr. Romani. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in to another amazing session of the Relationship Fitness Summit. We look forward to seeing you in our next episode. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. Isn't she amazing? And by the way, if you want more of Dr. Romani, she is a New York Times bestselling author. Her most recent book is called It's Not You, Identifying and Healing from narcissistic people. I hope if this session resonated with you, you will check out her book, many books, as well as follow her on social media. She's got some amazing courses and so much more to offer. And I just, I love her, um, her insights and expertise. I mean, radical acceptance when it comes to, I mean, it's like tough pill to swallow, right? But when it comes to recovering from narcissistic relationships, she is the go-to with so much wisdom. So if this resonated with you, I hope you keep following and engaging with Dr. Ramani's really wonderful material. And with that, that is a wrap of Getting Open. If you are not following me or subscribed to the show, please do so. I am bringing the show to you with my whole heart. I would love your feedback and advice. If you've got letters, uh, you can hit me up at uh, gettingopen at yourtango.com. Love to hear your, see your feedback in on um, uh, YouTube comments, on Spotify, on iHeart, on Apple, wherever you're getting your podcast. And with that, I'll see you next time on Getting Open.